Welcome on in to the Utah Blockcast. Utah moving into week two. We've got Baylor this weekend. I'm Steve Bartle, Utah Insider, KSL Sports. Joined, as always, usually, typically, by Cam Beck, Dyson Mall. Fellas, how are we doing? Just happy to be included once again. <laughs> Just happy to be here. This is... It's turning into a streak now. I think this is—is is this three in a row, or maybe just two in a row? I don't three, know. baby. I guess it's that's three. a turkey. Yeah. We are truly blessed, Tyson. We really are. <laughs> we really are. Like Steve's got his KSL insider and everything, and then with Cam and Tyson, we got to figure it out. Yeah, we got to figure it out. I'm gonna figure it out. I swear. I'm the gonna have you guys. Outsiders. We're gonna have an intro, an official intro with Cam Beck, Tyson Mall. Should it be Cameron Beck? Do you like it spelled out or do you like it Cam short? I, if we can make up a pseudonym as far as I care. Let's <laughs> let let somebody else take the blame. Bald guy Beck. Perfect. <laughs> a nice little nom de plume. If you I was will. actually yeah. at a, not to make it a downer thing, but um, at a funeral this last week and like oh. was around a bunch. Of, it was fine, um, but it's around a bunch of family <laughs> and, and stuff dude. and like, um, realizing that like it's actually not I, I'm not sure why I'm bald everyone in my family like <laughs> of my dad's family and most of my mom's family I'm just like you all have hair what happened what happened anyway, to you Cam felt, oh man felt, no I feel bad felt some <laughs> just I really just a lot of a lot of doors with with questions opened last week for me in that regard probably not where your head should be at at a funeral with a bunch of your family but your hair just, it's just that's perfect yeah focusing on my hair yeah <laughs> they're they're probably yeah okay how was the weekend labor day weekend we we're actually recording on monday so shout out to us recording while we're not supposed right. to be working let's do it let's do it but how was how was labor day fellas cam we went golfing yesterday so cool Sorry, Tyson. thanks 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 for invite, guys sorry Tyson, I was the fourth. If if it makes you feel any better, I was. I had no say. That helps. That helps. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, Tyson, no, how man, was your Labor Day? Labor Day was good. I I worked for about four hours today on on my house. So. Oh, on your house? Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. I'm on my house, and I didn't have to work. Not on the I clock. Just, no, not on the clock. Just work working on the on the new house, trying to you know just steadily chip away at stuff. Love it. Cam, how was your Labor Day? Pretty good. Uh, put some pork on the smoker. Got did yeah. Did some housework. Ooh. You know, all the all the classics. Love Sending it. Sending out the summer right. Oh, see that's Love my it. that's my that's my like thing I'm looking forward to most when we actually move in is like that said my I told my wife the first time we had people over I'm breaking out the Traeger that I've had for mm. two years and I haven't used once. Oh, buddy. I know it's a it's a big it's a big day that that first yeah. that first thing you put on. I'll, you never forget the first cut of meat you put on your Traeger, you know, like they say. Oh, I'm already going like pork shoulder, pork butt, something, something like that. Live, laugh, love, and first cut of meat on the Traeger. Okay, that's right. It's your wedding <laughs> that's day. That's what we're it's talking about, baby. The birth of your first child, and it's the first meat on your smoker. A lot of firsts, man. <laughs> love it. Awesome. Um, excited for today's show or this episode for this episode. Excited for this episode, man. Let me clean that up. Um. Jeez. On this one, we're going to obviously revisit the uh, the Utah game on Thursday night, what stood out there to us, and we'll also look ahead to this weekend's matchup with the Baylor Bears. Uh, overall, great to have Utah football back. It was a fun first game, but I think you know with the, the tone's going to change pretty dramatically this weekend with, uh, with Baylor, so that'll be fun to talk about. We'll also hit on our first impressions of Big 12 programs in uh, this season. You know, after getting the weekend to, to to digest some football and watching other teams and getting a feel for everybody, uh, so that'll be fun to talk about that. And then also we'll we'll talk on just college football the weekend in general and kind of some stock up, stock down, buy or sell type stuff. We'll uh, we'll we'll dive in uh, there. In fact, let's just let's just go there now. Week one of college football. What uh, what'd you guys take away? What did we what have we learned? What what stood out to you? Let's... I got one from uh, okay. A, anyone who watched the Sunday night game, uh, that USC and LSU game, which what a what an what an amazing start to college football with that game. Kind of, I mean, I know that there was a game tonight, Florida State, Boston College, but um, we don't need to pretend that happened. Um, 
the uh so so a great way to end the weekend with usc and lsu but um my my takeaway and this is i don't know maybe maybe not the the best that maybe utah fans aren't gonna love this but like man i'm, I'm kind of glad utah got usc when they did because they sure looked good on sunday night yes like, they did that defense like might be might actually be pretty decent like they were they were hitting dudes they were playing good in coverage they were tackling like at USC looks like a good football team right now. How much weird. money do you think Deon, DeAnton Lynn, the defensive coordinator for USC, how much money do you think he made last night? Because he, you turn oh, around wow. the USC defense that we've seen over the last five years, you He's got like, him looking like that? What? <laughs> um, no, I uh, I think that my the, the most hilarious outcome would be him immediately taking a head coaching job after this season and it's coming dude. having to yep. having to dip back yeah. into the well <laughs> dude yeah, that's what i'm saying like he made a lot of money he's going to be a head coach a lot of other programs a lot of other ad's are looking at that like man he did that in one off season at usc that's the Woo. thing is it's not like it's not like they looked okay last year at any point. Like that defense was putrid and they looked very good against LSU. Yeah. And like LSU looked very good on offense. Like yeah. Nussmeyer was throwing the ball around like crazy. Like some of the throws that both of those quarterbacks were making were just incredible. I, I don't know. I might, I, I know it's supposed to be college football takeaway as a whole from the weekend, but like my takeaway from that game was both of those teams looked underranked. Oh, Ooh, I don't know. Mm. Mm. That, That's that interesting. Was, what thirteen? Yeah, man. I think I think USC looked a lot better than frankly thirteen, and I don't think they looked so much better than LSU to say that LSU didn't belong. Like that. That was. I mean, that's that's the kind of college football game you can you really dream about. But no, man, those teams look sure. good. And on a neutral field, and really, and a it, it feels like probably more of a home game for USC because they're you know three hours or whatever from L or five hours or whatever from LA versus LSU. But LSU not. fans always travel. There was a ton of them yeah. there. Um, I think it was probably a pretty true neutral site, um, man. And just the shots of the stadium and stuff too. Like it, it was very nostalgic of, of some good times there. Oh yeah. We got that was fun. Coming. Like we got one coming. Oh yeah. That's right. <laughs> um, that was that was a fun game to watch, and I, I sort of agree with you that both teams look good. I just think, for whatever reason, Brian Kelly coach teams like they always seem to just be missing something, right? Like that's that was the thing. Like I can't, I don't feel like they're they're under ranked, like based on the players and the talent, the athleticism. I'm I'm with you there, but with Brian Kelly as the coach, like I I just. I don't see like that's the thing is he's the one holding that team back and as long mm -hmm. as he's there like I think they're going to be outside the top ten type program. Well, and last year it was that they were missing Harold Perkins um, because by choice, just by choice. Uh, taking him out yeah. of the game. Yeah. So at least he was <laughs> like, like in the game plan this this year. It seemed like they, he was more involved, um, but. No, I mean, it, like they kept talking about it during the game that this is Brian Kelly's like he's never won an opener since he's been at LSU. Uh, it's his third straight opening game loss and Florida State two times in a row, which it's easy to forget that Florida State before, you know, these last two games that we've seen, they were really good for two years. And then like that USC team was also really good. So I don't know. I, I'm not we'll, we'll get to this segment in a bit, but I'm not necessarily selling LSU yet. All right, that's fair. Tyson, what would you take away from the weekend? Um, I got two. Well, two takeaways. Uh, my like my biggest one was watching some of like you know the top teams like Georgia, Clemson, the Georgia Clemson game, or um, sh shit, sorry, shoot, Oregon. Yeah, remember we're a KSL podcast. <laughs> I know. Now. I'm sorry, Oregon. What I don't know what was going on there, but like some of these top teams did not look as dominant as I think a lot of people thought they were going to be this year. And then you had teams, I mean, obviously like, you know, Ole Miss beat the piss out of Furman and uh, Alabama. Who, it's Furman. They played. 
Al- like yeah tennessee playing chattanooga alabama playing western kentucky like they they did what they were supposed to but like i feel like some of those teams and then you had utah and kansas state dominating the way they should have i don't know part of me thinks it's a little more open this year maybe it's i'm thinking of that Furman game though how about jackson dart with 450 yards and oh, six touchdowns oh, in the first buddy. half of that game my goodness he was me? slinging it i was like that's was unreal oh like, like leave him in leave him in like yeah, just, let him go yeah, get, see, let him get, get there. yards. Get him them double digit tutties. You're paying game for one. Good money. They're getting they're getting a lot of figures from this yeah. game. Like yeah, so exactly. It just might be that they have to get 900 yards passing against them. Tyson, I'm I'm kind of with you. So my big takeaway was there were what three three primetime matchups right this weekend that included SEC teams. Miami, Florida, Florida loses. Notre Dame, Florida Texas looks A&M. Bad, bad. They look bad. Yeah. Notre Dame, Texas A&M. Texas A&M loses. LSU, USC. LSU loses. Three primetime games. The SEC goes 0 and 3 in. And I'm I'm with you. Like I think just is is the SEC as formidable as it once was in years past? I don't know. Like Georgia obviously looks like Georgia. There's no denying that. Yeah, I mean, but, we can't be having Georgia and Alabama erasure here. Like, they, no, they <laughs> they're still the, the cream of the crop. 94 points. <laughs> no doubt. But I'm just saying, floor, these were games like four years ago that they would win without a doubt. And they not, not forget, only though. they not only lost, they lost in pretty rough fashion. All three of let's them. Not, let's not forget, though, Texas is an NCC team now, and they that's a good point. They took it to Colorado State. That is a good point. Yeah, Colorado State, the big, the big mighty Rams of Colorado State. Hey, so. they almost beat. They almost beat <laughs> Coach Prime last year. They almost the beat Coach Prime. <laughs> hey, what, what the one thing, the one, the biggest thing for me, what that made me kind of like, um, like just have to put my phone down for a second. Iowa scored forty points. 40 points they had they had more they had more touchdowns by wide receivers just in this game than they did all of last year that's insane <laughs> 40 points by yeah, iowa the iowa hawkeyes that, this was their first game with three uh, i think the full cast brought this up this last week um but it was their first game this uh, since 2021 i think um where they had three receiving touchdowns uh very right. Very big moment for Iowa. Um, the yeah. three points, the three points in the first half were concerning, to mm. say the least. Though um, that I was saw that, that was, I was like, oh yeah, there's Iowa. We can't do this, guys. We can't start the season this way. Well, and Brian Ferentz, like it, he's the uh, offensive coordinator at Maryland now, and they scored a bunch of points. Yeah, they they uh, have the Ferentz figured out offense. Just I rearranged think, the the letters in their last name uh, offerings. Yeah, it was just family 50. drama, maybe. Wow, no way! What a world are we living in? Wow, twenty twenty four season, man, off to a bang. Um, all right, let's do a little stock up, stock down. What stock are you buying? What stock are you selling? I'll start first. I'm selling all of the offensive pass interference stock that you ever may have had (laughs) ever may have thought about buying because it's a penalty that just doesn't exist. There's no value with the offensive penalty passing the offensive pass interference penalty. It it's, it has space in the rule book and it's taking up too much space because it just, it doesn't, it's not a thing anymore. How many times did we watch receivers extend the arm, push off to make a grab Travis Hunter uh, in, in the Colorado game, Caught a touchdown to win the game. Uh, that's one. Omari Evans, maybe the biggest play in that Penn State West Virginia game, uh, right before the half. Blayton pushes off for a 63 yard gain that allows Penn State to score a touchdown before the end of the half. Um, we saw it last night in the LSU USC game. Just receivers extend the arm. That's all you need to do. The 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 penalty is not real. It's fake. Extend the arm, push off, make the grab. That's it. Yeah, I 
yeah it's it it, I, it yeah i can't even say anything it infuriates <laughs> me i hate it that's and what like, i mean like, even you... even to add to that like what's what's been worse the offensive pass interference or like actually you know what it has been it's been fine it's just the one time it got called was on utah it was the celebration penalty Oh my! On Dijon gosh. Stanley for spinning the ball, and then you watch college football for the rest of the weekend, and I think I saw at least ten that didn't. We saw called. three last night in the LSU USC game. Like <laughs> some of them, not even for a touchdown. Yeah, like, like, come on, this is this is what are we doing? This man? isn't a no fun league. Let's let's let the kids have fun. It's ridiculous, and every they did let the kids have fun. Just one kid was not allowed to have fun. Unreal. Maybe the guy. Maybe, Unreal. maybe the ref just really hates mustard. <laughs> he's got a, he's got a hatred. He's got just a, a fuming hatred for Dijon Mustard, Mustard. Ketchup guy from way back. Uh, ketchup uh, ass ref for sure. <laughs> he worked. Yeah, what Heinz. about you? He worked. He worked for Heinz his entire life until he until he got the refing <laughs> job. Man, I am selling, and this is somewhat somewhat in uh, the same the same vein as as your offensive pass interference. I am selling defense. Um, defense in college football is under attack from the rule makers, <laughs> from the coaches, and from just the strategic standpoint. First of all, that's partially because I don't know, like, quarterback play is just unbelievable now in football. Yeah. Like, decent teams have pretty dang good quarterbacks anymore. And, like, it used to be that there were four or five guys who were really it felt like elite quarterbacks and it feels like there's four or five of those guys in the big 12 this year of yeah. guys who who can win go win a game for their team um i i think that in addition to just so much talent on offense that we're, we're seeing more and more rule changes about uh a the offensive pass interference that you mentioned b um defensive uh defensive delay a game was one that was called against lsu oh yeah that too shift. yeah uh they were apparently making too much noise on defense and the offense wasn't happy about that and got five yards out of it. Um, I think for a team like Utah, it doesn't mean that you can't have a good defense. It doesn't mean that you can't invest in your defense and differentiate in that way. Um, But I think as a whole college football, um, and and this has been a long time coming, but I think if you're still holding on to defensive shares, it's probably start. It's probably time to start hedging some of those. Yeah. Agreed. Oh yeah. Very much agreed. Well, and like, even with Utah, right? We've already kind of seen the the trend, slow trend towards the offense side of the ball, right? More of an emphasis on that side, and you know, even this year they're taking somebody away from the defense and putting them on offense with Hunter Andrews making the move from linebacker to running back. When was when when was the last time we we saw that? Right? Like that's so. It's just there's a lot of things that have pointed over the years to Utah trending more and more to the offense side of the ball. And I think Cam is Tyler Huntley Cam have been instrumental in that shift in that trend. I mean, there was a pretty notable Sione Baki case, but I think outside of oh, the past yeah, couple too. of that years, yeah, I yeah. think that's fair. Like historically we saw Utah go the opposite direction. That was yeah, out I mean, of necessity was, though. That that not necessarily out of, dis- he, he out of out of want. I mean yeah. that necessity came; it paid off pretty well. That was a that was a good it sure did. Out of necessity. Oh, for sure. like, oh crap! Our safety is our best offensive player in years. <laughs> <laughs> Just hoarding all that talent on the defense side of the ball, and <laughs> they're figuring out, hey, these guys can do things on offense. But to that note, I mean, we mentioned Travis Hunter and stuff too, right? Like uh, he got away with one offensive pass interference, but like it feels like he can be so much more dominant on the offensive side of the ball than he can on defense. And especially when you've got a defense like Colorado, where it's just like, Hey, we don't have to attack Travis Hunter. There are plenty of other opportunities to attack this yeah. defense. Like why I hate to say it. Cause he's so dynamic on both sides and he is really, truly great as a corner, but like, why would you waste his energy on defensive snaps at this point? Like he, he should be playing especially at, there at Colorado, especially at Colorado. Yeah. I mean, and I guess he, he played every snap on both sides. They say this, this last game. Right. So like, I, think I don't think it's an two. issue in game one, but like in game eight, when you're like, Hey, this guy is gassed. Cause that's going to happen. It happened last year um, I, on top of injury and other things as well. But like at a certain point, he, you will have to choose. And I think it's pretty obvious what that choice will be. It's gotta be playing yeah. a receiver. Yeah. 
Tyson, what uh, what stock are you buying or what stock are you selling? I'm going to make it three for three on selling. Uh, mm. I'm selling, and and this is it's 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 a broad one, but money in college football, and it's in two in two ways. In two ways, one, advertising. I'm like I cannot tell you how upset I got multiple times this weekend, Utah game, and every game I watched this weekend where a team had like called a timeout because their play clock was running out where it should be 30 seconds, reset the ball and go. And it was a three minute commercial break oh, for a, for like yeah. a, a st- like a, you know, a penalty saving timeout that should last 30 seconds where they reset the ball. They know the play they're running, run the play. Yeah. And we got to wait yeah. three minutes for, you know, three, three, four commercials to go. I already have the <laughs> ESPN college football playoff commercials memorized. Dude, it's, it's ridiculous. Tune. I yeah, the word it's crazy, and the oh, see, so much. I, the, the Dr. Pepper commercials are back, and I, I forgot. I, I forgot that those are always a college football. Uh, I don't know. Very, it feels very confined, I and mean, like it's meta in that way, but it's very confined to the college football universe. Like you're never gonna come across one of those commercials outside of a college football game. <laughs> and like, well, what sucks is they're so good. Like I love them. They're so, they're such good commercials, but when you see it. <laughs> 10 times in the span of 45 minutes you're like you're okay, just like i, I want an 11th no i don't yeah i don't want an 11th but i love right. it you're like there's three versions of this commercial and i've seen all of them three times in one football game like, yeah i just yeah it's i think quinn i can't Ewers, wait for the though, fourth quinn yours and those commercials are fantastic i think that was that was a great uh that was a great nil move for him obviously but and for yeah. dr pepper like what a what an extension but my so my my other side of that and Cam, um, you 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 mentioned this to both Steve and I, and I was actually thinking the exact same thing over the weekend. The like the takeover of gambling in sports in general, but football specifically, I I don't need a thirty minute segment on college game day where we have to, like we're picking against the spread or. Like these are the best picks of the weekend with, from a guy who was like under 20% success rate all of last year. <laughs> and, and, the, and, you know, the, that's the, my uh, thing. Super too. dogs, the super dogs, like Cam, like you said, super dogs used to be about the guy, like the teams that were big underdogs that could, Oh, they could, they might be able to pull this upset off this week. Now it's, Hey, these guys might lose by less than Vegas thinks they will. Right, like, and it's I, just like, who isn't that supposed to happen half the time? It, yeah. Like, aren't they supposed to cover that that point total half the time? Like, what are we like, doing? Just what give me, we... just give me analysis. Give me, and like, leave gambling to the sports books. And like, you know, you can make your own show on ESPN where you talk about yeah the best bets you can do. Fine, I don't need to hear it anytime else. College what? game day should be about hyping up the games, analyzing yes. the games, like all that stuff. I do not. Preach. I'm tired of hearing about gambling. Talk about players, right? Like, yes. give me stories. Give me talk about players. Talk about programs. Talk about coaches. Like, I don't give a damn if, like, I don't know if, yeah, Furman might cover their forty-two and a half point like spread. <laughs> like, who cares? Who like, cares? They're gonna, they're gonna lose by six touchdowns either way. Like, I don't. It just. It used to be about. Yeah, actually picking an upset or and to your point, Tyson, like these if you're picking at 35% on like a season on your spread picks, why are we putting you on one of the most watched TV programs every Saturday morning to talk about gambling? You're really bad you're at you're bad. It. Yeah, you're bad. Oh, well, it's yeah. because so then you know people go run start making sports bets and these and FanDuel and DraftKings make even more money because he's giving them bad bets. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I understand that it's just how how are we as fans? I don't know. And I understand that, like, vote with your TV share and turn it off. But, like, man, they're just I, – I, I, I totally agree. I hate to see the way that sports media coverage is going in the sense of, like, if you can't bring this back to – some other monetary system like if you can't turn this back into either an ad or a gambling play then it's it's not a profitable segment and it's just like yeah it's very it sucks. Yeah, yeah it sucks um let's turn the convo to football 
And obviously, with Utah making the move to the Big 12 Conference, I think a lot of us were paying closer attention to some teams than maybe we have in the past, watching a lot of these Big 12 programs and kind of getting a feel for what, we, uh, what we're going to see from them, what to expect, just kind of first impressions of Big 12 football. And I got to say, there were some teams that, that impressed, some, some teams that I, I felt, you know, did what they needed to do and took care of business and others that uh, let down a little bit. So I'm, I'm curious to hear from you guys. Just what were your you know, general impressions uh, across the Big 12 this weekend? If you want to talk specific programs, like whatever, you know. I think it's a good conference. I think that um, the way the Big Ten looked at times, uh, they they certainly have great teams in the sense of uh, like like Ohio State is going to more than likely be great because they're almost always great. Um, Penn State looked pretty good, if not great. Mm-hmm. Um, Michigan, who knows? I mean, I think Michigan they looked a little bit too shaky. That score turned respectable at the end, but it was not very respectable through most of that game. Um, Oregon, what I don't know what was going on with them against Idaho. I've seen as many, I've seen fan theories as much as they were hung over, and that's why they didn't play. Like, that's <laughs> the state of Oregon football is that after their week one game against Idaho, they're like, the team was hung over. That, that's why they they're were not, drunk. They're not bad. Yeah. Um, I think the Big 12 right now has a case again if we're going back to buying, I think maybe buying big 12 as potentially the second best conference this year this is the way Ooh. I'll put it. Um, I, I think that it's probably too early um, mm-hmm. to, to say for sure. The, the SEC Definitely is going to be the SEC. But, yeah. um, but yeah. like the big 10 didn't, the big 10 just didn't give me a lot uh, to, to, to keep, to keep hold on to stock for, I guess I'll say. Hmm. I got you. Tyson, what, uh, what were your takeaways of, big, of the Big 12? Uh, the, man, highs and lows uh, was my yeah. probably be like the For main sure. takeaway. You got obviously the really bad lows, like Houston getting oh. drugged through the dirt by UNLV. UNLV. <laughs> oh, that's brutal. <clears throat> yeah, like, I mean, UNLV's, a, you know, a decent Mountain West program, but damn, guys. Come on. Like, yeah, come on. Texas Tech having to go to overtime with Abilene Christian, like, not great, um, really. But I, and then you know you had Iowa State kind of doing okay, and then Oklahoma State took care of business. Um, South Dakota State, State is very good, by the way. Like oh, yeah. Oklahoma Absolutely. State beat a very good team. Absolutely. Um, Kansas State took care of business. Baylor took care of business. Although again, against Tarleton State, uh, that I think just made it up to. A couple uh, years ago, yeah, they made the move up. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but I mean, the one the one thing that impressed me the most, two things that impressed me the most, uh, Arizona State. Yes, no idea where that came from. I, I mean, I kind of expected a win, but I didn't expect a forty eight to seven win. And the way yeah. that happened, and then the other thing is just mind blowing to me is is Cetro McMillan. My God, Oh, man. My God, that was that was a, and I'm not, I'm not gonna. That was a that was a Jackson Smith the Jigba game. Uh, Come on, I know. Come on, Tyson. I know. I know. I'm sorry. Come it's on, the Tyson. One thing I always go back to. Wasn't he coming at something like 30 yards per catch? Yeah, yeah it was 10 stupid. catches, 304 300 yards, yards. four touchdowns. <laughs> Dude, That's he was ridiculous. Unreal. Well, and that was a weird game too because New Mexico scored. Like that yeah. was. Yeah. I it was really, close for really most interesting. Of the game. The f- the first the half, game. yeah, the first half, like, you're watching this. You're like, oh, man, New Mexico is giving it to him. Like, this is fantastic football. It was a lot of fun. Like, um, Dampier, Devin Dampier. Half, right? Yeah, Devin Dampier was fantastic at quarterback for New Mexico. He had, argue, if it wasn't for T-Mac, he had probably the play of the game with his little option run, fake pitch to the outside that got the cornerback to bite so hard. Uh, it was fantastic. Um, but... Just T Mac, man. Noah to T Mac. That's going to be the thing for the Wildcats this year. That is yeah. an incredible quarterback wide receiver tandem, man. Incredible. Yeah, I was looking like I Arizona's was looking... always got one of those. Arizona seems to always have like a great receiver. They always have like a a, a tandem. If you can stop the tandem, you're you're good. I will say, I I don't know that I'm buying Arizona after that game. 
Um, I, I think they, I don't, New Mexico is not a good football team. Right. Um, and to let no, that they lost to Montana. Like they, they, they lost to Montana State in week zero. And in a bad way, too. Like, they yeah. should have won that game and gave it away. It's, yeah. I, I think, yeah. Uh, I, I think if you were having Arizona anxiety, you can put that aside for now. Yeah. 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 I agree. Oh, for sure. But I mean, that doesn't, I'll just, I'll just say it doesn't really, that, that's just an insane stat line, no matter who you're playing. Oh, yeah. No, of yeah. course. Like, 300 yards from a receiver, four touchdowns from a receiver, hell, 10 catches from a receiver. Any of yeah. those are a fantastic game. They did yeah. all three. And he held all three. All three of them. He hit the trifecta, <laughs> <laughs> the holy grail for a receiver. But like, but just... Cam, like you, like you said, like, uh, as, as impressive as that is, if you look at the rest of the box score, like, you slowed, you know, you slowed McMillan down. Arizona's offense is just meh. Yeah, pretty yep. much. So, yep. bracket. Like, so let me. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I'll give you guys my my Big Twelve power rankings, and you guys tell me. Just react as we go. Um, number one, Utah. Number two, Oklahoma State. Number three, Kansas State. Number four, UCF. Whoa. Okay. Really? I have immediate thoughts. Um, okay. I would probably put Kansas at either two or three right now. I yeah. so I'm I'm I so glad you said that yeah. because I had Kansas fourth and then I I went back looked at some numbers and I flipped them. I had so I just flipped UCF and Kansas. So I have Kansas six. I have Arizona fifth. Kansas sixth. Here's here's my pushback on UCF is. KJ Jefferson looked bad. I, I I don't know if you watched any of that game. They they won easily, like fifty seven to three or something like that. They ran was. for four hundred fifty yards. It was and, insane, and they had to against New Hampshire. Yeah. But like again, New Hampshire is not a very good football team. No, and but KJ Jefferson like he looked bad. Like he 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 threw the ball very poorly against a not good team. And it's just like, hey, if this is what you're going to do against this team, you're just going to get eaten up um, if you play a team like Utah or, frankly, any Big 12 team who can, like, have a serviceable defense. I mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I am curious to see if they can stay two-dimensional throughout the season. Tall task. Um, all right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Arizona 5, Kansas 6, like, Kansas 6th, like I said. Um, Kansas, like... They're they're going to be interesting. Like Jalen Daniels, you look at some of the raw numbers, not great, but he has just an incredible way of impacting these games beyond just the numbers, like picking up first downs, key first downs, picking up, you know, and, and that sort of stuff. He's going to be instrumental for them this season. It, it, he's just got to stay healthy. So I've got, that's, that's the top six. I have TCU seventh, um, Baylor eighth. I put Arizona State nine. Ooh. And I think I'll say sorry. this about it. I'll say this about Arizona State. I put them ninth because this very well could be the highest they're ranked in my power ranking all season yeah. long. Like they they looked fantastic week one, very surprising, but also not. I've I've talked about them potentially being the twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth best team in the conference, not sixteenth. Like I I feel like they were. I've always felt like they were going to make improvements this year. Kenny Dillingham is doing a good job down there. He's recruiting the 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 types of athletes that he needs. He's not going all in on skill players. He's addressing the trenches first. And I think that's what we saw week one. They've they're gonna have a a, a pretty solid run game. So I put them ninth just to kind of say, hey, good job. We'll see what happens the rest yeah. of the season. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's 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 a week it's a week one power ranking. Like you base off of week one, they've like, they did very well week one. Yep. I think that's deserving. Yeah. I don't I don't like TCU ahead of Baylor personally. I don't know. Okay. I don't know about TCU yet. Um I think that it, I th- I think they are still uh, I looked good at, at times and like it, it had a lot of yards despite like especially in the past right. game. Um but I uh, maybe it says more about what I think about Stanford, but I I think that TCU has a long a long road ahead of them and it, like they play smu is it next week maybe that maybe week three uh i think that it's will next be, week is it next week okay for sure i think that will will tell us a lot more about tcu in my opinion 
I'm I'm with you. I gave TCU the the edge there over Baylor because you go on the road against another Power Five program like that's I'm gonna give you that. Um, all right, last six. I'll just give them to you real quick. Ten. I have Iowa State took care of business, but man, there are some question marks uh, there with Iowa State. West Virginia tough first game against Penn State didn't look great. Colorado I have twelve. BYU I have thirteen. Cincinnati fourteen, and then Texas Tech and Houston. 15 and 16. That's fair. Which fair? one is 15 and which one is 16, though? That's... <laughs> I thought about that. But <laughs> Texas Tech, I have 15 and Houston. At least I have Cincinnati 16. won. Or no, yep. no, sorry, not Cincinnati. Uh, yeah. At least Texas, Houston, at least Texas won. Tech won. Yeah. 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 Texas fair Tech. Enough. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. And, all right. Yeah. At least they scored some points, too. Like <laughs> yeah. seven points against UNLV. Give me a break. That's at home? Tough, man. Yeah. Oh. That's tough. Oh, man, that's tough. Um, All right. We are going to take a quick break, and then we'll be right back to talk about Utah football. (laughs) Welcome back, Utah Blockcast. Yeah, a lot of of gambling talk. Too much gambling talk. We don't need more gambling talk. Uh, (laughs) We're going to talk Utah football. Utah gets the win, 49-0. Over the Southern Utah Thunderbirds, Thor the Thunderbird, uh, the mascot, uh, our beloved you know friend down there in Cedar City. Um, fellas, I don't know that we're good friends anymore. <laughs> I don't sour, know that. sour grapes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some, for a couple of weeks. We we'll need to let yeah. that let that air out a little bit. <laughs> uh, just what are your takeaways from from Thursday night's game? Uh, I mean, saw pretty much everything we need to see. Uh, I, I have some nitpicks that I, I I wrote a newsletter about for Utah for UtahBlockcast.com. Um, but overall, I think you saw everything we we talked about uh, in in kind of our our last episode, minus maybe one or two things. Like I don't think SUU officially got a sack, but they did get some pressures on Cam. Um, they, they, they knocked him down a few times in the backfield, especially I think on the very first play of the game they did, yeah. um, which was, which was disappointing. Um, but, uh, overall loved what we saw from the offense in the first half, especially, um, loved seeing cam look like cam, uh, if not on every play, like 85, 90% of the snaps, he looked like what we would expect to see. Um, saw some things we didn't like, uh, mostly related to, Cam and his running upfield, uh, but happy to hear Whittingham clarify some of those comments uh, in in his media availability stuff that already this week, saying that it looked a lot better on film than it may have looked initially. Um, yeah. I respectfully disagree, Coach. Uh, it did not look better, <laughs> and he he should he should not do that anymore when, unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, but I mean, I mean, just overall, I think injury stuff aside, hard to be hard to be disappointed with anything we saw on Thursday night. Yeah. Tyson, go ahead. I mean, every, like offense the, the just looked like they were humming and, it, and, and they were passing like they, 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 they weren't taking their foot off the break when they got up like kind of bigger in the second quarter. Like they were still running their normal offense as if it was a zero, zero game. Um, <clears throat> I really liked seeing that. Um, again, I have the same thing at cam. I have a couple nitpicks here and there, but um, nothing like too major. The, the only thing that, concerned me a little bit is I, I really hope Spencer Fano is ready for inside inside moves from defensive ends because they are going to spam the hell out of them after after watching film on this week uh yeah that was the only kind of concerning bit but I you know we all know how good Spencer Fano is so I, I don't have I, I don't have any doubts that he'll clean it up and and lock that down um that was my only that was the only thing that was like a little bit concerning to me if it happens again this week then yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna raise some alarms but i i i have full full confidence that he'll he'll clean that up but that was my only kind of real small nitpick so so yeah i'm i'm with you guys above all else we saw what we needed to see uh in game one Maybe not everything we wanted to see, like Dorian Singer or Mike Mitchell going off, but I think it was. I think it's it was way more important. It's almost like the vegetables of the meal, right? We, as a kid, you got to eat your vegetables. That's what this game was to me, in the sense that, you know, 
Cam and Brandt, you know, I bet if you were to ask every Utah fan that showed up at the game, there was probably still a little bit of doubt that they were actually going to suit up and play. Oh, for sure. you know, and that's, you know, like that's just what that's the product of what Utah fans Trauma went response. through last it's, year. Yeah. We're setting yourself up for, for disappointment. Yeah. So, you know, I, I feel like there was still that fear, that angst, that worry, that doubt that, you know, Cam and Brent weren't actually going to suit up. So to actually see them on the field suited up, you know, and then to play the way that they did, I think just everybody is feeling better about Cam, about Brent and about Utah football this year. So I, I think you know, again, as much as we wanted to see a Dorian Singer go off for, for big yards, and he would have, I bet, if Cam Rising isn't pressured in the manner that he was on play one, Dorian Singer has a pretty good chance of ripping off a long one for a touchdown. He was up the seam. He was wide open. He was splitting the safeties. If Cam had even just a split second more time, Dorian Singer is off and running for the uh, for the other end zone. So, um, yeah, uh, it, again, so we saw what we need to see. Uh, Cam and Brent are the foundational pillars of this offense and of this team. And to see the see them the way that they performed, I think, was much more important than anything else we could have seen on Thursday night. Well, and we did see something that we really wanted to see, uh, at least uh, some of us, I think, depending on on how. Uh, you know, paranoid we were about game planning for the future. Caleb Loader touchdown, game one. Yeah. How about that? And from Isaac. Let's go. Yeah. What a what a what a throw. What a catch. Uh he he dropped the one that uh going back to the earlier segment. That hit him right in the hands. He had an that he pushed off on off, <laughs> offensive pass interference. No call. No call. I don't know how you don't like if they're not gonna call that too, it's just not gonna get yeah, this year. Which is a not. great benefit for Utah because he's got like four foot arms. So he, yeah, it's that, a lot. He's gonna of, create a, a ton of, of separation. Yep, just box oh. out first, man. <laughs> One thing I'll say is I don't know if this was also your impressions from the game, either of you, but um, and and also curious if other Utah fans were feeling the same way. Um, probably partially because Utah was doing so well through the air, uh, had five first half touchdowns um, all through the air. Uh, it didn't feel like Utah ever really established a running game and throughout the game, yeah. but looking at the box score, it just doesn't compute really because they ended up with 185 rushing yards. And yeah. surely a lot of that came in the second half when they're, you know, Isaac Wilson was a little bit more limited in the passing game. Um, and, but like 185 yards on the ground is absolutely nothing to, That's a good day. to be disappointed about. It just yeah. happened to be spread across uh 10 guys and so yeah it, yeah, it, it, it never felt like anyone any single player established a rhythm um but you had two guys with over 30 yards you had three guys with over 20 yards you had another three guys in the teens and then uh three other guys who or two other guys who had oh so i guess how do, that's 11 people who had a carry of some <laughs> that's crazy but, wow um yeah overall i think uh I think a really good day, both passing and running the ball, even though it felt like passing dominated, which again, going back to last episode, the episodes before, it's kind of what we expected for this year. This team is built this season to throw the ball around. And so yep. um, it, good to see that, you know, they actually had a, a pretty good balance of the running and passing game overall. Yeah. It, it's interesting. So, you know, this, the, the team um, only averaged five yards per play or per carry, I think. That's what I'm looking at. Is that what it is? Five I yards? 4.7. 4.7. Okay, yeah. Um, which is fair. It's not great. It's not what we typically see in these in these sort of games from Utah. I think if you look at, at games in the past, in the past three years, um, you know, that number is usually up in the six, seven, even eight-yard range. So I'd only see five. A little disappointing there. But I think what's interesting is, you know the the stuff percentage. How many run? How many of your run plays? What was the percentage of run plays that were stuffed for min to no gain? Um, for no gain uh, was on par with what we saw in previous FCS matchups against Weber State, Southern Utah, and Weber State in 2021. 
28.9% in this game. It was the exact same number in last year's game against Weber State. And so, you know, it's not that they were getting stuffed all the time. It's just, you know, run plays went for five, ten yards. A couple went for two. So it was just, you know, it was, it was an efficient game. A lot of guys got involved. Uh, but to your point, Cam, we saw a lot of big plays in the passing game. Um, what did they end up with here? Passing 12 plays. yards per attempt, 12, 12.6 yep. yards per attempt passing. And it's so like when you're doing that, it's hard to do much else. Uh, yep. like yeah. We've talked years past about what, what a good number for that is in college football. And like anything over 10 is pretty phenomenal. Um, and so being, being over 12 is, I, I mean, again, SUU adjusted. That's a great, that's an right. absolutely great day through the air. Yep. So uh, we saw, so again, just to recap, saw it, Cam and Brent, what we needed to see. We saw a passing game. We saw a lot of a pass, a, a lot of the passing game in, in Thursday night's matchup with Cam and Isaac. Um, and I thought it was, I thought it was really good that, you know, Isaac throws the two interceptions, but that didn't necessarily deter Utah from, you know, allowing him to pass more, right? Like they continue to go to him. I thought it was great that, you know, after the first pick in the first half, Come come back to him in the second half immediately and allow him to you know throw it around a little bit. I think that that was good for him. Um, you know, pass protection like we've talked about, like you mentioned, Tyson. The one nitpicky thing was was probably pass pro. I thought they did okay with Cam. They did better with Cam than they did with Isaac. Part of that too is Isaac has to get the ball out in a timely manner. Cam was so good at getting the ball out pretty quick. He had plenty of time in the pocket on some plays. But as you said, that inside defensive ends getting to their inside, and that was both Spencer and Caleb. Uh, Caleb Lomu on the left side struggled with that, where they were giving up the the inside lane, and that's the quickest route to the quarterback. So that's something that I'm sure Coach Harding and and those two guys, Fano and and Lomer, are going to to work hard on this week because you know with Baylor coming in, they're a program, they're a team. They like to shoot gaps. They like to counter and and get to the quarterback as quickly as possible. So that's going to be a point of emphasis for them as well. And then, you know, one last thing. I think, um, you know, we talk a lot. We've obviously Brent, Caleb, uh, the guys that are are headlining the tight end room right now. But going back and watching the game closer, I thought Dallin Bentley, Carson Ryan, and Mickey Sugaturonga were fantastic as blockers um, in this game. And they're going to have opportunities to catch passes. There were a number of opportunities where they were wide open. It's just Cam got the ball to Brant or somebody else. Um, they're going to be contributors in both phases of the game. Love what I saw from all three of those guys. Going back to the stock up or stock down uh, segment, stock way down on e- on commentators for, uh, oh, for oh, that game. Man. Oh, my goodness. Speaking of Miki, just Miki Suga... Um, Actually, I, I forgot for, how to say his name. I forgot <laughs> how to say it. Completely gave up, and just he <laughs> he had absolutely no idea how how to say Tonavasa. He tried about thirteen different ways. <laughs> yeah, and dude. <laughs> just and the worst part about about uh, frankly both of those names is it's just like it is exactly how it's spelled. Just <laughs> that's the thing. If <laughs> you know involved, all, you need to know. Yeah, all you need Sounded to know, yeah, all you need to know Polynesian name with Polynesian names is. Just sound. It's it's one sound, sound for vowels. A e e o u. That's it. Like that's all you gotta do. Just sound it out. Just like sound the, it out. It, it makes it very like, tough. Did you guys watch the? Did you guys watch the the like the Lions game, the preseason game where I think they're no first or second one. I think the, I normally I think watch the, the Lions preseason games though. So I know. I'm glad you asked. Big I time know, subscriber. Sorry. Just busy I was that just night. on the couch during nap time, and just that was the only thing I could I could watch. But uh, the commentator, I think, was just trying way too hard to pronounce Sioni Vaki's name, what he the way he thinks a Polynesian would. Like what I kind of applaud saying? his effort. He, it was <laughs> Sione Vaki. Ooh, I'm like, dude, Vaki. No, a little, yeah. Just the emphasis was just Sione. like as wrong as you could get. Sione, <laughs> a little less elbow grease on that. <laughs> like it's like a, it sounds like an Italian mobster. Sione, it, it's like it's Sione Bucky. <laughs> I like awful. to think that he so thinks bad. that Bucky's Italian. Yeah, <laughs> he's like Sione Bucky. Look at Bucky. this Italian. 
or he's just heavily the announcer's just heavily Italian. <laughs> he's it's doing just... he's doing the hand motions while he says, "Ah, yeah, oh, the reception, <laughs> the only cutlets." <laughs> <laughs> I got it's the only baby. For what oh man, oh that was. I was worried where we were headed with that, but that I, just, I miss. Was I just. I miss the Pac-12. I miss the Pac-12 network. I miss you oh, all, my man. Oh man, just wow. really never gave got it sad for for that with like the content, the the production value of Pac-12 games. Like if, yeah. if you so could good. get them, if you could get those games, they actually had very you enjoyed very high yeah. yeah, they were great. Um, here's what I don't understand. Why can't they just have Bill Riley do the, do the game for ESPN? Like he's like, I don't get it. Why can't he just do them? Him and Scott and Sly, like that would be a fantastic crew to do these games. Some kind of probably like Learfield media contract rule stuff. Like I, I just want, just give me an option to put the radio cast over. Yes. Over the, it's time. It's 2024. Let's figure this out. Yeah. Make it easy for us, Samsung. Anyway, or... thanks for that detour. I just, I, I, I would have been remiss without mentioning, just again bringing up how bad that was. It was bad. It was Tenu Vasu. <laughs> so so bad. <laughs> Truly, I think the worst, the worst commentated game I've ever seen. It was bad. And well, then on the touchdown like... to Loner, they called it for Brandon Rose. They were yeah. like Brandon Rose touchdown pass to Caleb Loners. We're like, oh wow, I guess Brandon Rose came in, and then they're just like, brutal. Oh, correction, by the way, uh, that was still Isaac that was Wilson. still Isaac. That was still the same quarterback. Um, all right. Uh, any any other thoughts from the game before we look ahead to Baylor here? For both teams, season starts this week. Yes, it does. Yeah, I. Uh, I think with Baylor coming in, Baylor looked good uh, against Tarleton, uh, but you know, it's Tarleton still. Tarleton uh, but Tarle- so that, that's by the way, that's Tarleton State. Oh, sorry, Tarleton, Tarleton State. State. Sorry, that's, my bad. Yeah. Respect to the Tarletons. Is that their mask? Is that their mascot? Tar- what is their mascot? They the are, in fact, the Texans. The Texans. Ah, yeah. the Texans. They, they, yeah, I mean that that school. This feels a little bit like a college football 25 simulated like school name. I like, feel like Tarleton State Texans. You're just like, that's not a real school. <laughs> that's dumb. <laughs> I feel the Texas Tarletons would be way cooler than the Tarleton Texans. That's awful. That's tough. It's pretty bad. It's that's lazy. a lot of T words. Lazy at best. Oh, man. Very lazy. Uh, all right. I will say With, I did uh, watch Tarleton State against McNeese like last week. Um, or bro, I okay, what? again. I you were asleep on the ball. couch again. Yes, it's exactly what I was doing. That is that they is are, a deep are, love. They they are <laughs> the sicko. They are sicko not behavior. good. Sicko. They are not. Good. He's the guy behind the account. <laughs> I believe you, Tyson. I I'm believe you. That Tarleton guy. State is not good. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing nothing else about them other than the fact that until this conversation might not have ever heard of them or said the words Tarleton State. I love State. how you just like casually I was watching Tarleton State and McNeese Tarleton State, State last State. year. Yeah. Um Listen, yeah, guys, like I mean, that's like that's a normal thing for, for Utah fans to be doing. <laughs> but it is it's it's helpful context in the sense of like, okay, so Baylor won forty five to three. What does that right. mean? Um, probably not a lot. Like you got, they played him at home. Um, it, you know, it was hard to say where home is for Tarleton state though. They are the Texans. It's a big, they are the Texans. It's the whole state. Um, yeah. So <laughs> everywhere they, is their home. I, and maybe they travel well and 200 fans showed up for them. Um, but it, yeah, it, it's hard, hard to really get a gauge from that game. So I, I think that it, I don't know, not quite sure what to expect from Baylor other than it, what we saw last year, but also knowing that like Daquan Finn is new to Baylor this year coming from Toledo and he looks like a very capable quarterback Um, kind of like I mentioned big 12 quarterback play looks very good and he's part of the reason why I'm I'm really curious to see um, you know if Utah can limit him more than the you know the uh, the fighting Tarletons did 
So here's the thing, like we've been talking to Quan Finn up and I think, like I said earlier, I do think that he's a really good fit in that Jake Spavital, uh, Jake Spavital offense um, where it's that spread, the run and shoot, the just the run and gun type of, of offense, a lot of option, a lot of RPO type stuff. And that's where Finn is going to be really good is in those option looks just because he is, he is a good uh, dynamic athlete and can create a lot of things with his legs, both in the run game itself. And then also, you know, freewheeling in the passing game, getting out of the pocket, that sort of stuff. So you are, Utah is going to have to account for him, but with that, he still threw two interceptions against the Texans of Tarleton state. Yeah. And I mean, he's, he's very much a running back playing quarterback, yes. right? Like he, he, yeah. he threw for 2,600 yards or something for Toledo last year. Um, it, it is Toledo. They're Toledo. They're a, are they a CUSA or are they a Mac team? They're Mac, right? Mac. Mac. Yeah. Mac. Um, which is probably the worst of the two conferences, frankly. Um, and so 2,600 yards there is, uh, you know, less, <laughs> less impressive than maybe it seems on the paper, but he also ran for 560 or something like, yeah. Um, he he's very capable as a runner. It's because probably that's primarily what what he is. I think the most impressive group on this Baylor Bear squad is that wide receiver room. They've got a a handful of guys that are dynamic playmakers. Keytron Jackson is a transfer from Arkansas. He was actually with them last year. I don't know. I can't remember if he played last year against Utah he or did. not. He, he did. did. Okay. Uh, like and 70, then seventy seven yards or something. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then Ashton Hawkins is a smaller slot receiver. He's really dynamic with the ball in his hands, make guys miss, that sort of thing. Hal Presley is another big receiver on the outside. He's a guy that, you know, for the recruiting nerds out there, Utah was very much in pursuit of him a few years back, wanted him, uh, I don't want to say desperately, but he was one of their top guys, top targets. Uh, he actually committed to Auburn, then transferred to Baylor uh, almost immediately after. They've just got a handful of these guys in that wide receiver room that, you know, if Finn gets them the ball, they can create plays. And they've got some big bodies with Speed and Presley and Jackson. They've got some shorter make-you-miss type guys. And then they've got a couple tight ends. Michael Trigg, who is a familiar name for those of us that have followed Jackson Dart uh, over the last few years. Um, Michael Trigg, former USC Ole Miss tight end. Uh, and then a couple other guys in that passing game. So that's the the strength of this team, in my opinion, is that wide receiver tight end is it's not a traditional tight end like Utah uses them. It's more of that spread pass catching tight end. So altogether, that group I think is the strength of this team. Yeah, th- and they spread it around a lot. Like none, no yeah. one on their team they they had eighteen receptions against Harleton State. No one had more than two. Yeah. And like Hal Presley, the guy you just mentioned, didn't even have one. They, he had a couple of targets. Um, but yep. didn't, didn't actually have any completion. So um, very by committee from that group. Yeah, very by committee. <laughs> oh, man, sorry. Um, like, and with that being said, like, I mean, the the big the biggest thing for me uh, this week is, is the defensive line. Um, obviously, like, uh, we want the corners and the safeties and the linebackers. You got to be able to cover these guys. But um, – to have like to have a guy like uh to have a guy like Finn who's not necessarily like the greatest like pocket passer you got to you got to you got to you know screw his rhythm up you got to get him you got to get his feet happy you got to make him rush his decisions because that's when the mistakes are going to happen that's when the picks yeah. are going to happen so uh as much as it comes down to slowing these guys down as as the DB group and the linebackers the D line's got to got to disrupt that yeah. And the thing here with Baylor is the offensive line is and has been considered the weak part of this offensive side of the ball. Just going back and reading through some of the uh, the preseason stuff and, and all that. This is a group that's going under undergoing some change. Uh, it's a young group. Some of them are uh, started last year. Uh, so it's it's a mixture of guys. They gave up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pressures to Tarleton State in that game not a lot of good PFF grades in pass pro um and so for Utah this is going to be a game that like you said Tyson uh, it's you got to win in the trenches for Utah you got to be able to get pressure with four to keep numbers in space I think that's where Utah can create some turnovers is if they can get pressure on Finn 
while keeping numbers, you know, in coverage. But with that, you're also going to want to mix up looks and bring some blitzes because that's going to to get Finn thinking and and getting the wheels turning, and that's going to be tough. So I think I'm excited for the defensive game plan uh, that Scali will have for this. Uh, This is going to be a tough test for sure on the defense side of the ball just because, again, Finn is dynamic. He can create, and that's going to be a tough test tough test because it always is but i do i am excited for the game plan of what we'll see on saturday well and knowing the way this team is built too it it's very i guess i'll say i'm i'm eager and prepared to see a lot of the from the baylor offense in the terms of uh of option plays rpo plays screen plays um things where they can take their offensive line out of the out of the equation a little bit mm-hmm. um and so i really like like you mentioned, it's going to require a lot from ends, from defensive ends, and from linebackers playing on the edge, um, to make sure that they're uh, they're playing really disciplined, make sure that they they know their rules and assignments really well. Um, but then ultimately, yeah, a, a great opportunity to, uh, to get in Finn's face and cause some turnovers. His, his interceptions, if I remember right, were both on deep passes as well. Um, yeah. So he he will he will make you know he, he'll make throws that he probably shouldn't when he feels like he's got to get the ball out of his hand. And uh, I think that'll be a big advantage for you, Todd, hopefully create a couple turnovers there. Um, just need to make sure that you get him into passing situations. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. And I think switching to the other side, also pretty excited to see the game plan for, for Andy Ludwig, Cam rising and, and how they'll go about attacking this Baylor defense, because this is a group that's, uh, just similar to to the defense side of the ball, defensive line is undergoing a lot of changes. I think they have three new starters on that side of the ball. They lost two to the NFL uh, in Gabe Hall and somebody else. So you know you're missing, you're replacing two veterans, two guys that have been key pieces to that defensive front. So that's going to be tough. You do have a linebacker returning in Matt Jones. That's the leader, the quarterback of that room. He's the tone setter. He's good. He made plays against Utah last year. Um, you know, a couple plays that I, I think Utah would love to to get back uh, with uh, with old Matt Jones. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm interested to see that. Would love to see the tight ends get involved with Matt Jones, you know, in certain ways. Uh, perhaps, you know, getting their hands on him, being a little extra physical in the run game. You know, would love to see that. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, with this defense secondary, they do return everybody from the secondary last year. It's just the secondary last year wasn't very good. Um, and so, you know, you're still feeling pretty good, even though they're returning, you know, most of their starters, um, you still feel like you can create some plays in the passing game against the secondary. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not that Utah is going to be able to move the ball at will against this team. They're not like Baylor is going to be tough. This is a tough defense. Dave Aranda is taking over defensive, uh, coordinator duties for the most part. He's going to be calling the plays. It's going to be a tough test, but I still think like there's, there's enough here for Utah to be pretty productive on Saturday. And I mean, could it be more different between last year and this year with in regards to like the offense and their offensive play calling and the offensive weapons? Then we'll not having to figure out how to win this game with Bryson Barnes and Nate Johnson. You mean? Yeah, Yeah. exactly. And no. And so my, my biggest thing too, I keep, and I keep thinking about this because you think about how, how dominant of a game Brent had last week. You come into this game and Baylor says, oh, okay, Brant Keithy's back. <clears throat> and he's still Brant Keithy. Uh, we better we better stop that guy. And Andy Ludwig gets to go, okay, cool. Uh, Dorian Singer's over there. Uh, we'll just, yeah. we're, we're do, just me that favor, do me a favor and double cover <laughs> Brant Keithy. Let, yeah. get let after us, Keithy, let us would you take him away, it. please? And then again, you got Money Parks. You got, uh, you got uh, Alfred. You got... Landon King, who I didn't see much of uh, last week, and I'm just like he's he's one, is, and it's one. It's going to be a game where he just comes out of nowhere and has you know really has is. a day. So if yeah, who who you who you going to cover? Who are you going to stop? Who are you going to try and slow down? This ain't we ain't Arizona, Utah's not Arizona. You can't slow down T Mac and 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 you know expect that. Like it's just you saw it on Brant Keithy, and you then okay, Dorian Singer's gonna go off. This, uh, yeah, this will be fun. Um, this defensive front, it is so they do replace 
uh, you know, a couple veterans, the guys that have been there, like I said. But they've got some guys. They've got better size this year, I think. They've got a couple guys that are 6'3", 6'5", 290 pounds. Uh, they've got a dude 6'8", 270 pounds that rushes Ooh. off the edge. So they've got size. It's a different sort of size, um, and they can get after the quarterback. They're able to to get into the gaps and, and create pressure. And so pass protection, just like it always is, the breaking news here, pass protection is going to be the top priority. Offensive line has to be on their A game this week uh, for me with uh, with this defensive front and with Dave Aranda calling the plays. He's he's going to want to get Cam out of this game if he can. Um, and so, yeah, I think pass pro, just like it always is, top priority for Utah. It gives me an idea. Would Caleb Lohner play both ways? Can we get him over at defensive end? He's about that size. He is about that size. Get him rushing off the edge. Oh, man, that would be fun to see. Um, I played in high school with a kid that was all, not not that weight, um, obviously, but was like six seven, six eight, and just he played defensive end and just watching him extend on these poor offensive tackles who would just like couldn't reach his jersey <laughs> because he was fully extended on them with his such long arms. It was just hilarious to watch him just ragged all these guys. Um, so yeah, <laughs> gotta look out for that. Got to get into that guy's body, and if you let tall guys like that extend on you on the edge, it's going to be a long day. Let me see here. I'm pulling up. Okay. Not to mention, you probably mentioned, but just batted balls, too, from guys that size. Like, they yeah. can just see the whole backfield. Yep. Um, here's what will be interesting uh, with the offensive game plan. You know, we talked about the run game and how surprising it was that they ended up with 185 yards, right? It Nobody really, there were a number of guys that were 25, 35-yard type guys, right? This could be the game where we see, you know, this this tier of running backs, Mekhi Bernard, Jalen Glover, Mike Mitchell. Um, this is where we could see that separation, where these guys become the focal point of the run game, and they become, because the run game could be pretty important in this one. Again, just kind of talking about the defense, and you know, you're gonna have to account for Brent. We know that. You're gonna have to account for Dorian, even though he wasn't uh, you know, he didn't have a big game last week. You know, they're paying attention to the press clippings. They're seeing what Kyle Whittingham has said about Dorian Singer. They're gonna make him a point a focal point on the defense side of the ball as well. This could be a game where, you know, we do see the run game kind of get going. Uh, in terms of you know it becoming more of the run game we're used to seeing from Utah, if that makes sense. So I, I'm I'm just I'm interested to see if that ends up being the case this weekend. How important would that is that important for Utah? Would it? I guess just what do we think about the run game potential this week? I I mean I like it. Again, you got uh, you got all the offensive weapons like receiving weapons that Cam's got. You got the the game that Cam just had against Southern Utah. Um, Baylor's going to be dropping guys. They're going to be they're going to be looking out for that, and that's just going to open up lanes for you know for Mike Mitchell, for uh, Jalen Glover, for Makai Bernard. So I, if you they what they need to do is not necessarily expect like a workload because I don't think that's going to happen with again with what with how Utah's running offense now. Um, they need they need to maximize the opportunities they have when they get the ball in their hands. You got to you got to hit holes correctly. You got to make correct cuts because they're gonna be there. Like those yeah. those 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 big plays are gonna be there. You have to take them when they when they present themselves because that again that's just gonna open everything else back up. Utah's not gonna establish a run this this season. It's just not gonna it's just not gonna be it's not gonna happen. So you got to maximize your opportunities when you get them, and that's and just I gonna think- open everything else up. I do think it adds a strategic advantage, though, of not having a like singular back like Utah's had in the sense of, like you mentioned, Tyson, it's going to be a lot. It's going to give Baylor the impression of pass probably more often. They're going to drop guys more because they've got to account for pass because they don't have like the obvious poor personnel grouping of like, oh, Zach Moss is coming in. We've got to we've got to have an extra linebacker. in. Um, oh, like, you know, it, JJ is coming in. We've got to have an extra linebacker. We've got to bring a safety down. Um, there's going to be an aspect of like, yeah, any play could be a pass play. Any play could be a run play. We've got to be balanced kind of in any situation. And so I, I do think that there will be some opportunities for guys like 
I mean, we Dijon Stanley led the team in rushing against SUU. Um, we saw what he could do in the in the receiving game as well, coming out of the backfield. It's like, yeah, there will be opportunities there, even just because they have now tape of him coming out of the backfield and doing electric things passing. You drop a guy back to account for that, and now he can run free for three or four yards. Um, yeah. And so, I, I do think there will be, there are some advantages to not having that, um, you know, RB one guy. Um, on on the roster right now yeah and you know it'll be interesting once we get into the game obviously you know cam is has this offense mastered um like he had he knows it like the back of his hand the coaches have the trust in him to get them into the correct plays in the right situations and so he's going to have the freedom to get utah into the best situation possible not only the freedom he's he's required he's tasked with doing that, getting Utah in the best situation possible. And with Baylor, what's interesting is, you know, they're a heavy quarters team. So they're they're keeping four back in the defense secondary. That's their primary coverage. And then their next biggest coverage is cover one. So they're either keeping guys back or they're up and they've got one safety deep. And so, you know, that's a it's not an easy key, right? They're gonna disguise it. They're gonna do different things to hide it. But it's going to be up to Cam to identify those looks. And with the amount of quarters that they play, that's going to lend itself to the run game being more of a factor in this game. So, um, you know, Baylor runs quarters on 35% of their plays, and the opposing offenses run 60% of the time against that quarters coverage. So just that's I, I think that's we'll see a lot of that just kind of depending on you know what we see defensively from Baylor is going to deter- going to determine what we see from Utah on offense and that'll be that'll just be a kind of a fun chess match between Ludwig, Aranda, Cam and and the Baylor defense. Um but certainly I think with what we saw last week, you know, with the passing game being what it was and the run game having more space to operate. Like it was fun to watch Jalen Glover and Makai Bernard make cuts last year that they just not last year but thursday that they couldn't make last year just because there was no space to do that like it was fun to see that it was fun to see the cutbacks it was fun to see them making moves you know getting through the knifing through the line um these guys uh, there could be opportunities this week to make more plays like that and with mike mitchell um you know it'll be interesting to see his workload and what that's going to be this weekend obviously he's the big guy of those three and and is certainly capable of taking on a bigger workload is he ready to do that this week we'll find out so it'll speaking be fun of stock, speaking of mike mitchell i'm buying mike mitchell's acting stock that, Dude, that, that, yeah. sell, that sell on brant's first touchdown was incredible or at least his gymnastic <laughs> stock that's like, yeah. that jump uh <laughs> he, he got, got a up. whole line he got way up he got that way was up. A, and then i think he got body slammed but yeah, it. it was a long way down. <laughs> <laughs> just got caught. Just got caught right by the right by the linebacker, and he just kind of rode him down and just right onto his back. But it was perfect. That's, and that's what you want? You want selling out like that? And so that's I was just going to mention because I talked to Mike today at, at our media availability, and I asked him about that play, and he was like, "Coach Ganther was like, you want in on this?" And Mike was like, "Yes, I will jump and I will do it. I will sell it." He wanted to be that guy to sell this play action. He wanted it, and he knew that if he did, like it was going to work, it was going to pop. And you look at that play, fantastic fake by everybody involved. The offensive line selling the run without getting past the the yard marker for you know illegal man downfield. Cam tucking the ball behind his back for a split second, uh, and just uh, Brant pacing himself off the line of scrimmage and then exploding you know, after a split second. Just that whole play executed perfectly. Loved it. Um, any final thoughts before we wrap up? See you on the Bucky. I got one quick one. Uh, Utah sack leader, Van Ooh, Fillinger, Van baby. Fillinger, baby. Ooh, Big Van, Van Fillinger. Van Fillinger. Fillinger. Um <laughs> The uh, yeah, we're all Italians. Yeah, this is probably more offensive than yeah, pretending. But yeah, um, anyway, uh, I regret nothing. Um, yeah, would love to see again against a 
potentially a team whose weakness is reportedly offensive line would love to see Utah get more in the backfield and record a couple more. I think they ended up with, was it four total? Um, I think uh, two from Van, one or uh, one split between Logan and, and then John uh, Henry Daly and John and, Henry, yeah, Daly. John Henry yep. Daly. Yep. So uh, would love to see another, I don't expect four against Baylor necessarily, but would love to see a, another couple at least. Yeah. Tyson, what do you want to see this week from, from Utah and Baylor? Uh, Cam, it was actually five. Dallas uh, Bacala, he had one too. He had one hmm. too. I forgot about yeah. that. Good call. Um, a true freshman. Not big. Uh, I'm big into, again, the running backs making the most of their opportunities that they are going to get, uh, that they are going to get this week. And then seeing how Utah, again, attacks the defense, how, how they're, they're going to key on Brant. So how are they going to, how are they going to counter that? How are they going to spread the ball around? And then on defense, just, disrupting everything um i want to see you know at least uh, hopefully three to four sacks two or maybe two two to three um but for the most part just getting back there and just disrupting everything whether that's um daquan finn's you know passing ability whether that's getting um hits on the running backs in the backfield um disrupting all of that disrupts the entire offense so and um also, I want to see who steps up on the other side of Zamaya Vaughn, my corner. Um, yeah. If, if that's Scooby, that, that awesome. If that is, um, um, my, I'm fried today. Calhoun. Cam Calhoun. Cam Calhoun. Calhoun. Yeah. Um, I know he's, I know he's kind of needs to get ramped back into, into stuff, but, um, yeah, I just, who, whoever's going to step up over there. And if it's by committee, it's by committee. That's fine. As long as, yeah. as long as, you know, they step up and do their jobs, but, um, yeah, that's that's what I want and ex- actually expect. So, yeah, um, man, excited for the game. This is this is the uh, the reality check for Utah football, right? Last week was the welcome back party, uh, and everybody was excited to see Cam and Brant and all of that. But this is where we we truly learn, um, you know, a lot about Utah football and what to expect the rest of the season. So we'll get a, a much better picture of Utah football's potential after you know with this game against Baylor. One thing to remember about this game too is it is not a conference game. This right. is this is a non-conference game. Not only is it not a homecoming, conference game, but it's it big is, full yeah. of homecoming. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's not a conference game. Game against a conference opponent for the conference homecoming game. Yes, <laughs> precisely. You're Holy exactly right. moly! A lot of things going on this game. Official and I think... in every way except for the official record. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll finish with this. Last thing I, I'm I, I want to see, just want to see Cam, uh, you know, operating at a at a high level, efficiency, making good decisions, being quick, um, you know, with his with his decisions. That's what I want to see most this weekend, right? Uh, kind of following up on last weekend was was the welcome back party. This is the reality check. It's none more important than with Cam, you know, at quarterback. And so excited to see what he looks like this weekend against a Power Five opponent, conference opponent, non conference game in the conference homecoming week. Uh, it, excited for it. So, um, fellas, appreciate you guys. Appreciate the listeners. Make sure to listen, subscribe. Leave the five star ratings if you want. Leave a review. Uh, we'll get back into reading those. Those are always fun to read. And uh, appreciate you all. This is the Utah Blockcast signing off.